Thank you, Tom. Um, we got to do these more often. And as Sonia knows, usually I'm way out of the mainstream on these things. It's amazing. <laughs> I agree with everything that Dom Tuminaro said. Uh, I, what I just want to add a little bit uh, with respect to the ILO, because again, I always get nervous. Are we, oh, the ILO, we won and nothing happened. What's going on? Anyone know of a model of, of, of how to challenge uh, public sector uh, exclusions and in terms of union rights? Last month, April, we commemorated a tremendous sacrifice, one of our martyrs, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The corporate media doesn't like to tell us what Dr. King was doing down there in Memphis. He was, as this crowd knows well, supporting a strike of black sanitation workers. What were they striking for? I mean, fundamentally, it wasn't about wages or working conditions. I mean, those were issues. But the fundamental issue was the right to freedom of association that Tom spoke about. Right? And how those workers win the right to free association, of course, is the everlasting, everlasting tragedy that it took Dr. King's losing his life to get there. They did it through fighting, through direct action, organizing, and striking. And they did overcome that prohibition. So I hope this ILO and the lack of effect it's had on the U.S. government doesn't uh, deter us. I think we do have an amazing uh, direct action precedent uh, for uh, changing these kinds of laws. Um, with respect to the brother, uh, I try to talk workers out of the certification piece, but once you go down that route, you got the vote coming up, I say do whatever it takes to win. Forget everything I said, win. You gotta win, nothing else matters. Um, the question of helping unions innovate. Now look, to be fair, there's no question that when there's leadership changes that are positive in a union, it, there's, there's change. There's no question about it. I'm lucky to be friendly with many people who have ousted corrupt or incompetent uh, incumbents and, and taken over and really improved their locals. There's a huge tradition on the left of, of trying to capture leadership or, or be elected as leadership of, of, of unions and trying to reform them. Those are good things. I support them. I think, though, um, the problem is not to demoralize you. Uh, is not so much, you know, who's in charge, you know, that could, that, that has an effect, but it's, it's not really quite fundamental. Um, uh, the, the, the problem is the structure, the structure of the business union, um, whereby through a dues checkoff clause, which we didn't have time to get into, uh, whereby actually the employer and the union, they have the financial relationship. The post and the industrial works of the world, for example, where its constitution actually bans the dues checkoff clause, which is extremely controversial in the traditional union movement, and the worker pays the dues to a fellow worker who's been elected as a delegate. That's a tremendous check on abuses of the union, because what are you going to tell your fellow worker that's corrupt? I'm not going to screw you. I'm not paying you dues. And it also takes the employer out of this, frankly, very, some of us probably think, sacred relationship between a worker and the union. We don't want the employer uh, in the way. So you have the dues checkoff model. To get that, you need the certification for recognition. You can't get that if you don't have that. Um, and, and then you see, you know, the pension fund comes in and the union can profit off that. You know, and officials can. And you have the incumbents and they get really comfortable and they use patronage to solidify their loyalty base. Time and time again in history, recently in distant, Folks have waged very noble, courageous campaigns to try to take over these, these traditional unions and reform them. And we just haven't seen, you know, we have a big empirical record on this. Stoughton really very um, delineates it with great detail. Um, we, we've yet to see this different kind of unionism. So um, yes, run for office. Yes, create a rank and file caucus. There's fantastic examples and the Teamsters and many other unions of, of rank and file caucuses. It does do good work. Um, but what a few of us, but thankfully a growing number, are, are really arguing is, is that we have to really dr dramatically restructure um, this work away from the exclusive bargaining representation uh, to direct action and solidarity. Um, Nonprofit workers organize all the time. It's, it's a very difficult sector to organize in, especially the, well, all of them are difficult, but especially the movement-based ones that tell you to sacrifice and exploit yourself for the movement. And if yeah. you complain, you're just, you're self-centered. It's all about you. That's nonsense. Uh, nonprofits are, some of them are very large corporations. Some are smaller corporations. 
Um, they do engage in union busting with all the viciousness that for so-called for-profit corporation um, engages in. I was recently privileged to informally advise a campaign at a nonprofit that succeeded and is doing well so far. I'd be happy to help. Um, but I, I would say in a nutshell, uh, what you're doing and, and others in the room, I think is the most profound thing that any of us could be doing with our lives if we're interested in global justice. That's organizing at our jobs, or if we're not in a position to do that, allying ourselves with folks and helping them and being there when they ask us to be there um, who are organizing their jobs. We all love the general strike. We love the plant occupation. We're salivating, we can't wait. Um, but there's no shortcuts in this work. Um, and, and to get there, uh, we're gonna have to support courageous people like you who uh, will profoundly change both your workplace and help your coworkers plug into Occupy and the global justice movement and start to be able to act as a class that can really transform the economy. Okay, Taft Hartley, in a nutshell, so you can talk to your coworkers uh, tomorrow. Don't get caught up too much on the negatives, so get the negatives out of the way. Yes, Taft Hartley is a wicked law. Yes, it gets in the way. If I work at, let's say, a bakery, we're making buns, we're trying to, we sell those buns to McDonald's, right? I'm in a union, the workers at McDonald's are trying to organize, and my union wants to strike the bun factory, you want to cut out, cut off the buns to McDonald's until McDonald's recognizes the union, let's say. Taft-Hartley makes that unlawful. Are the penalties serious? You better believe it. When a company violates our rights, the penalties are, they would be a joke if they weren't so sad. Taft-Hartley, it's just amazing asymmetry. Taft-Hartley penalties are really bad, including having to compensate, let's say you shut down McDonald's for a year, you have to compensate McDonald's for that whole year of profit. You imagine violating uh, Taft-Hartley. So Taft-Hartley is wicked, we need to get rid of Taft Hartley, there's no question. There's other things there that are also negative. I don't wanna to take too much time on that. Um, but what did Taft Hartley not do? Taft Hartley does not take away your right to strike in solidarity with a coworker at your employer. Including, let's say if I'm a McDonald's in, in Illinois, I'm working there and we have coworkers in California and, and they're not organized yet. No one, not too many people I think are organized at McDonald's in the world, but Let's say we could strike together, right? That doesn't, that's not prohibited by Taft Hartley, although many no strike clauses prohibit that. We talked to labor lawyers and you spoke to this, Amy. Incredible, they, they, Taft Hartley just makes you see, can't do anything. You might as well stay home, right? We recently resolved our biggest campaign yet at a hummus manufacturer. The employer told us at the bargaining table straight up, and this is all from secondary pressure, all lawful under Taft Hartley that our campaign was costing the company $6 million each and every year. $6 million a year using secondary pressure, not outlawed by Taft-Hartley. 